Hello everybody, uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Gabriel. I'm an SSP and designer at Red Hat. Just uh, so we can know who here is a Red Hatter. Can raise your hand, please? Okay. Yeah, a lot of customers, uh, think, thanks for joining us. Who here is from Latin America? I know some Brazilian people, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit more about uh, real-time payments and OpenShift. Uh, here with us today is Henrique from Banco Original, a great Hello, institution John. from Brazil. Uh, and yeah, I think we can start with the agenda, right Henrique? Yeah, so hi everyone. Like Gabriel said, I'm Henrique. So today we're going to about we're going to talk about some real-time payment processing using Red Hat OpenShift at Banco Original. So we will cover a lot of overview today for all the, the Latin American and all the Americans too uh, of the Brazilian bank scenario and a lot about how our, our challenge, what our challenges were and how we solved them. So my name is Henrique, I'm Brazilian and yes, I love soccer if anyone's wondering. It's a, it's a stereotype, but it's a pure, pretty reliable one. Uh, I worked mainly as a software engineer, but also in architecture more recently at DevOps as a manager, and now I'm, I'm a tech manager. Yes, I do love soccer too. Actually, I found out yesterday that uh, Enrique plays soccer every week, and he didn't invite me like until now. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> but he lives, he lives far away from me, so, but I'm still waiting for it. Yeah, right? sure. Yeah. We have to. Uh, as I said, I'm a solution specialist and designer at Red Hat. Work with a lot of FSI companies, and uh, also previously I was a an architect at Open Innovation Labs. So I love all the things about digital transformation and uh, real cases. Uh, and here, I think to start, we should tell all the people about Banco Original, right? And uh, the journey of being like the first digital bank in Brazil, right? What can you tell us about it? Yeah. Uh, as we're all in an in, interactive in session, just to know who here is familiar with di the di digital banking or digital banks, raise your hand, please. So yeah, some, some are not. So just an overview, digital bank is a real bank with no agencies or branches. Everything is done online. You open your account online and with an app, and, but it's a real bank. So we, Banco Regional, are the first digital bank in Brazil. So. Uh, we started with a lot of challenges, even laws. Laws have to be changed because you had to go to an agency or a branch to open your account. The manager needed to see you. So we started all digital with facial recognition. Remember, it, it, this is 2016, so it wasn't a thing. Uh, even here, uh, imagine in Brazil. And so today we, are, we have a, a large set of products in 2019. Uh, we, we changed our strategies for, for, for three years. We operated with external partners. Now everything since 2019, uh, we internalized all the development department and all new products were developed. We, we absorb all, all kind of know-how. And today we have 10 million opening accounts. And as I said, a large, a large set of products. So yes, as Enrique said, and uh, I think that we can frame it as a, a, a mobile technology rising during 2016, 2015, or since the, since the uh, release of the iPhone, right? And uh, Banco Original was the first uh, digital answer to this new kind of necessity that the society in Brazil uh, had to financial services because it was the first bank that didn't have any branch like to, so the customers, uh, to, to receive customers. And uh, they actually had like a pretty complete and solid application, right? To establish communication with their customers. So, and we are talking about 2016. So this is prior to the, to the pandemic. And uh, you, they, when the pandemic rise, uh, started, you guys were pretty ready for the situation. Uh, that also followed um, some new services that were pushed by the Central Bank of Brazil in 2019, one of them being the open banking architecture, and the, the other one called PIX, that is the real-time payments in Brazil. And then yeah, so, so just an overview, PIX, as Gabriel said, is the real-time payment system. 
It basically allows anyone to transfer money between accounts within 10 seconds. So uh, the idea of our central bank was like to include as many people as possible in the banking system. Uh, and it brought a lot of new challenges, but a lot of new opportunities to the banking market. And it, it has a sum of requirements for participants. Bank Original is, is a participant. It has to be fast. So as I said, transactions must be completed within 10 seconds. It has to be available. So it's a 24 seven system. And it has to be secure. As I said, everyone needs, needed to use. So it's countrywide. So it has to be secure with, with some, some rules and, and with help, the help of technology also. It has to be integrated. So uh, every bank is a, a participant. We have a lot of uh, non-banks, but financial institutions or even fintechs that can be part of it. So it had to be integrated. It had to be versatile. It, it opened a lot of opportunities to the market and it launches on a lot of new features uh, every month or every three, every quarter. So uh, every bank that is a participant has to be versatile to adapt to those features. And it has to be cheap because it's free for users. So every individual that has a bank account can use Pigs for free. And just uh, how do we use it? So if I like, I need to pay a coffee for Gabriel. So I really type his key yeah. and the, the amount that I owe him. Uh, and uh, my, my bank app communicates with my saying and the, he receives the money within 10 seconds. Uh, a key is mainly uh, an identifier to his account. It, it's pretty much either his uh, social security number, his phone number or his email. So it's pretty easy. I don't need his bank account number or, or anything like that. Uh, in the background is a little more complex. Uh, here, just to illustrate that not, not only banks are participants, so we have uh, direct participants and indirect participants that communicates with the addressing database that is the SPI. Uh, a direct participant is mainly a bank, a regular a regulated bank. Macuri now is a direct participant. And indirect participants are any other company or tech company that wants to be part and use PIX. It can use this through the direct participant communication with our central bank. Uh, it's pretty, pretty big today. So uh, I think I can say almost 100% of people in Brazil use it. So we have today, this is from last month, so it's, I think it's, I, I, I'm sure that th these numbers are already bigger, right? yeah, bigger right now. So we have uh, 500 million keys registered, 146 million users. Brazil has, I think, 220 million people today. So it's mainly everyone that, that uses a bank. And we had a uh, average 80 million in transactions, uh, transactions, AIs in transactions daily average okay, in, in 2023. So just to summarize it, like none of the Brazilians here, they would have any cash reais in their wallet because nobody's using cash anymore in Brazil. Am I right or? Right, right, yeah. So uh, what is PIX is doing is kind of like changing the way that we do payments through our day-to-day -day activities. So, uh, and also like with credit card and also open banking APIs uh, and also these Changing the society also brought a lot of challenges to the companies to answer with that. Uh, as, in, as in Hickey said, like, uh, you don't have only uh, direct uh, participants, but you also have indirect participants that can use the APIs from the direct part participants to participate in the ecosystem. So you have a lot of companies that are included in the global ecosystem of the Central Bank of Brazil. And also that raises like a lot of the, the numbers of about the transactions and also the amount. Uh, and also availability uh, was a really different thing because you had to be 24 seven, right? And then in 10 seconds, every transaction. Uh, what can you tell us a little bit more about like how Banco Original technologically faced those challenges, right? Yeah. Because it wasn't like from the day to the night that you solved all the problems. Yeah, we have kind of a journey. But uh, before that, oh, oh, everyone that's standing up, there are 
a lot of places here, lot of places feel here. free to come here, okay? Feel comfortable. So, uh, like I said, we have a, a journey. Uh, we came, we started uh, with legacy, we had legacy systems that wasn't developed by us. Uh, we have a IT-ish department, actually only validating stuff and products. And today we have 100% of managed microservices, at a distributed environment, and every, uh, everything is managed with OpenShift. So how do we start from here to there? It wasn't a short period of time, so we had, I think, three years, I think three years of a long journey to, to get from here to there. And we have some steps in the middle, I think. Uh, Every one of these steps were really important for maturity and to, to get where we are today and really to, to implement PIX because yeah. it was a big challenge. So uh, after our legacy systems, we started internalizing our, our, our development department to have our, our know-how and uh, we started developing our standalone applications uh, and new products. Uh, but uh, with all the evolution in the ecosystem, in, in technology, we saw a great opportunity in using this, a distributed architecture, developing microservices. So we have a lot of work of migrating a lot of our standalone applications to microservices, uh, but microservices weren't manageable at all. So we have a lot of VMs with a lot of Java processes there, uh, each one in one port, uh, and a, a lot of batch applications. So we needed to manage, we needed to limit uh, memory, to limit use of resources. So we started using Docker with all of that in containers. But uh, even that, we didn't have all that managed. So we have to like have all kind of alerts for containers. We have a lot of manual work. Uh, that's when we started, we started uh, searching in the market for solutions so we can have all that managed and we started using OpenShift to be to get all those containers managed all uh, it's actually what it was actually a new, introduced a new culture culture because we use only docker containers now we have a managed service like based on kubernetes how do we spread that word inside the company and he can actually like if you can Talk just a little bit because when we met, it was actually during a DevOps event, right? That I was doing like a webinar, right? It was kind of like a talk because uh, it was live, right? And uh, also, uh, since that day, I saw that you guys from the architecture team was trying to bring everybody together, like not only for the operational side, but also from development. And you actually had like an idea to create like a TV series of webinars and do kind of seasons, right? So it's not only about like having the best two, but also trying to uh, make everybody like to feel included and also to develop the, the, the right culture to, to, so these uh, systems they can foster in the right way. Yeah, so with all those new challenges that PIX brought us, because uh, I didn't mention, but we have a, a really short period of time to develop everything of PIX. They announced, I think in late, uh, 2019 that we we had to have that in production in November 2020 so we uh, we had to run not not only us but every bank and uh, when we implemented and started using OpenShift mainly the infrastructure team take care of that the the developers and the architecture team and the other security team uh, weren't involved I think at all but uh, we saw the opportunity and the the need to have everyone involved because everyone needed to know uh, how important that is and how uh, OpenShift and the, the other tools that I'll, I'll mention uh, could help developers in their uh, day by day, our, the architecture team defining patterns and the security team uh, guarantee all the security in our environment. Exactly. So that's uh, when we started involving everyone to spread that idea of a, a new culture for everyone to develop and, and know all the, the benefits that they could have on their, on their job. Yeah. Okay. Oh. So uh, talking about PICS, that's 
uh, a big picture of our architecture overview. So we have a hybrid environment. So we have a lot of things on, on premises and with Pix we started using cloud, mainly AWS. Uh, we have OpenShift installed on our on-premises environment and it manages it all. All, this is an overview only for Pix. So on the on-premises side, we have over 70 components uh, connecting with the, the cloud side that has over 100 components. Because like I said about opportunities, we started uh, selling our services, Pix as a service, to other institutions, indirect participants, and even to, to other banks that didn't I had the time to develop at all. Like I said, it was a very short period of time to develop PIX. And uh, OpenShift controls er mainly everything on, on, on our on-premises side. We don't have OpenShift controlling, helping us manage the cloud side yet, but it, we have in a, in a, we're doing a proof of concept, we're doing a lot of tests to have that up and running pretty shortly. And uh, we faced, when we started using OpenShift, some challenges. So we had a lot, a thousand of microservices. We have to worry about deployment. How will we deploy uh, using a pattern? How we will deploy that safe? And how will that environment be secure? So we started worrying about security. How will we, we are a bank, so everyone, everything has to be secure. I don't know if every, anyone, may, maybe someone here works at a bank. Uh, it has to be secure. We have some regulations to follow. Uh, so it's, it's a, a mainly thing that we have to worry about. And reliability, so it's a lot of products. So they have to be reliable. I can't have, like, if a client needs to withdraw some money, the services, it's not working, so it has to, everything has to be reliable. We had hundreds of developers. As I was in the architecture team, we have to worry about uh, how do we define patterns to uh, developers worry only about developing products. So we have to worry about abstraction. They, they don't have to worry about infrastructure or security. Of course, uh, security in developing, security in code, but not security of uh, the environment itself. Uh, their services needed to be easy to deploy. They, they had to have ease to deploy their services, to, not to worry about all the DevOps pipeline. They have only to worry about developing. And uh, like I said, they had to have reliability to develop, to know that what they're coding today will be in production and working as they and the team expected. Uh, and lots of new products being released. Not only peaks, but a lot of new products in the banking market uh, was being released. So you guys know how the, the product teams are. They, they, need, they need things, they uh, pass us the requirements and we need to deliver. So uh, we have, because they, they worry about time to market and we have to worry about to develop their products, to be secure and to be available. So all the products need to be, need to be available. The withdrawal example is a very good example. So uh, the withdrawal had to be available if someone needed to, to withdraw 10, 10 AIs like at 2 AM. So. So, yeah, and uh, I know what you guys are thinking, right? You look at this and you say containers because that's not possible without containers, right? And uh, if you think about containers, you're thinking about Kubernetes, right? And uh, so you, got, you guys actually had a discussion about Kubernetes, right? was the first step to think about that. Yeah, so uh, we were using containers here and we had to give the next step. And I think is the most common path of most tech companies. So let's start using Kubernetes to manage all that. Uh, it can manage containers, you can use pods, everything is as a resource. So, but as a company and mainly as a bank, we had some concerns how the configuration of that environment would be, uh, how, how much time we needed to, to get the configuration uh, up and running the way we needed, how would we have security of our applications and even image security. So I think everyone here knows about uh, like the, the Log4j problem, so that was a concern for us. Uh, the knowledge and the learning curve for our teams, developing team, developers team, 
the even our team, the architecture team, the infrastructure team, because we were on premises environment, everyone managing VMs and stuff. And uh, this, the, yeah, the, the security team, the developers team, and the infrastructure team. And uh, how about support? So we're a bank, we have to be available and reliable. We're regulated, so we needed support if something happens, happened. And then you guys found out that we have something called OpenShift. Yeah, right? and OpenShift Plus. Yeah. And it answered most of our questions. So we saw that we have easy configuration. And so with just a few steps, after had that in our environment, we, we could configure everything as we needed as a bank and a regulated institution. We had security, image security, using ACS because of our, our applications. I'll get more of that later. Uh, we, have a, we had a no low knowledge curve. So with that, we could get our developers worrying only about developing, our security team worrying only about security, our NS architecture team worrying about the architecture of all of it, and our infrastructure team not only worrying about VMs and all the manual work and stuff, but now managing uh, a pretty distributed environment pretty easily. And mainly we had Red Hat support. So that was, I think, the main point for us. Uh, if something happened, we had a support on all of those topics. So uh, like he said, he was given a workshop and a lot of others that occurred that we had your help to spread all the knowledge about OpenShift and Kubernetes and distributed architectures uh, with easy configuration. You guys always helped us a lot. What, what you said that really strikes me is that you said like, developers should focus on the value strings, right? So if we talk about team topologies, like you have the platform, then you have the string aligned teams that deliver value direct to the customer. Uh, so you try to separate like complexity from those things because they, they already have complexity dealing with the needs of the users. So you had like a platform as a service that you could use. So you could have like something more templated already that for them to establish and create their applications on the top of it, right? Yeah, and even they didn't have to worry about the, the pipelines and it was very easy for the DevOps team too. The team that has to worry about the pipelines, we, we, we don't use yet the OpenShift pipelines, but we use Tecton with Argo CD, interacting with OpenShift and it made it pretty easily for us to, to deploy and use deploy strategy like Canary release or a blue green release or even a simple rollout or stop start. So yeah. it was pretty easy for, for the, the DevOps team too. And some stats. So how are we today only on the big scenario? So we have 10K pod, about 10K pods up and running. Uh, we process 1 million PIX transactions a day. We have 99.9 .9 uptime and we can process uh, until now. I'm pretty sure that we can do a lot more of, of that. 130 transactions per second in PIX. So it's, uh, th that was a peak, but our environment was were pretty uh, healthy and not in alarm. Dynatrace didn't blood, you know, so didn't blood. And uh, yeah, actually, like what strikes me is that you also said that you talked like about a lot of developers. You guys actually have you have hundreds. another number? Yeah, hundreds, right? I think like uh, about four hundred. Four hundred. So a lot of teams, and you are the architect guy. So you need to establish patterns through the company, right? Because you you're thinking about the long term journey. So what can you tell us like about how this platform as service helped you to also uh, spread the knowledge uh, and also to make it easier to the other teams to use it? Yeah, so like you said, uh, we have to worry about uh, a lot of people using our products, our pipelines, our banners, developing stuff. So it has to be simple yep. uh, because uh, new developers come, come in every day uh, we teams grow up, teams split in two or, or more teams. So, and applications and products keep growing. And uh, uh, defining and implementing patterns could be a headache if you have a messed up environment because you have to worry about, oh, this, is, this will work on this scenario, but you know, the, the PIX guys 
uh, they have a different environment, so it wouldn't work for them. The like transaction guys had a different environment. They don't use like Kubernetes. They use uh, I, I don't know Node.js with something else, and so uh, it it made us it made pretty easily for us to define all those patterns, and gave us confidence that it it will work on every team. Yeah. So here we are also talking about, and uh, I know that you had a lot of uh, of work because you leaded some. Uh, some of the initiatives around CI/CD, and you guys uh, use like source image. You guys use Tecton, as you said, Argo CD. Uh, also, like a lot of observability, right, and monitoring resources because, as you said, like it needs to be 24/7. So you guys use it a lot of like the probes and health checks that are already present in the platform. Yeah. So uh, we had Dynatrace, but Dynatrace only help us. Uh, help us a lot, but with alerts and stuff. But uh, we defined the patterns actually for uh, probs and, and health checks so we have a reliable environment. Like I said, it was a requirement for PIX, but actually a requirement for a bank and a requirement for uh, an IT department, okay, a development department. Everything has to be reliable. The product guys need, need to know that the product they, they thought about they, discover, they, they, they had to work a lot of discovery on interviews and everything has, has to work on, uh, what, on the way they, they, they thought of. Yeah, and, uh, uh, just, and you can move to the, to the next one. Uh, so also we know that PIX is still going on. We still have like some new products that are being released. Do you think that uh, having that approach, like also not only like to, to implement it the two, but also to help the teams to understand it uh, helped you guys to reduce the time to market to release new features? Yeah, of course, because like now developers can only worry about developing and security only about secure security and infrastructure about infrastructure. So you so, keep them safe off like the yeah cost. yeah they, they they didn't have to worry about anything else. Uh, but like I said, we uh, what helped us a lot was not not only OpenShift. We used uh, those three platforms that help us a lot. Again, we, were a, we are a bank, and ACS helped us a lot with image scanning and... Integrating the pipeline, right? Like to... Pipeline yeah. integration and every, every feature, mainly. Uh, Red has OpenShift platform. I, I think uh, there's no need to say any more about that because yeah, it's, it's very clear. And we, we started we starting using ACM more, because on our hybrid environment, it's becoming uh, a thing to to worry about and multi-cluster like, management. Yeah, right? we have multi-cluster management uh, on the on-premises side. We have multi. We have uh, some clusters on the cloud side. We have a lot of clusters and everything needed to be managed. Because on the cloud side, we we can we have a lot of products that. A lot of partners and other companies, other banks, other financial institutions use a lot of APIs. So we have to have that managed too, and it's going pretty well. We have some good results. Uh, we're at the beginning. We're making a lot of proof of concepts now, but we're having pretty good results. And uh, also, one thing that I remember is uh, it needs to be scalable, right? Because like the as uh, we we had in Brazil, like. The five first days in the month we used to be like a little bit crushed for for banks because, but now with Pix like it can have it can happen at any time, right? So you spoke a little bit about probes. You guys also use the, the horizontal horizontal pod outscaler to the, to provide that scalability that those seventy applications that you said needed, right? Yeah. So uh, those things helped us a lot, uh, and new products are being released. So Pix open. A lot of new opportunities, new products uh, using Pix on the, the the backstage are being released, and uh, we have a lot of adoption of our customers. So we HPA and uh, uh, Prob and Did you say tech. backstage on oh, the the background. Right? Yeah, the background. I know, I know, but yeah. we yeah, but spoke a little bit about. Yeah, we also yeah. use backstage, but I, I'm I mean in the background, and and uh, with that Pix keeps ev evolving. So that's those are some features that. Are helping us to to keep in, keep keep the, the pace with Basin and Pix. 
So uh, those are some highlights I got from the PIX agenda of our central bank. So uh, they're implementing international PIX. So at some point we will, we will, we will, we, will, we, will, we can transfer reais to dollars and uh, any other country. They're starting working with direct debit and uh, guarantee assets with PIX and the payment API. I think uh, the, the payment API is the really important one. Everything's important, but it's a, the main one because it could, uh, the idea of that is to distribute the, the PIX, PIX and payments for anyone. Uh, today, I can, you, I can pay all my bills using PIX. I can pay anyone or anything, any retail, but the payment API will bring a lot of new opportunities and, and, and a lot of new features for the bank environment, for more people, for more companies, and it'll be a lot of, there will be a lot of new things, so, and more. So uh, you, we spoke a lot about like delivering code to production faster, scalability, scalability. With all these new products that need to be released in the next few years, what is the biggest challenge that you want to, to, to succeed now? Uh, and what do you see in the years for come to, to OpenShift and Banco Original? I guess it's, uh, keep growing and have our, have our te technologically speaking, had our cloud environment all managed because uh, we have products there that other partners use and more customers use. We can, we can achieve much more customers and a lot of new products we could build and uh, have a, a revenue for the company because you know that's a, what companies are for. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, having all that manage and everything interacting and everything working is our challenges for the next. And multi managed, right? Yeah, multi managed. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's it. We have some time for questions. And, uh, yeah, uh, we have some time for questions. Yes, sir. No problem. You said you were running multiple OpenShift clusters on prem. Sorry, didn't hear that. Uh, sorry, I'll slow down. You said you were running multiple OpenShift clusters on prem. Yeah. How many are you running on prem? If you don't uh, mind me asking. We have three today. So because we have uh, multiple data centers, so we have one. One in each data, data center. center. Yeah. And is that ten thousand pods total across all three clusters? Total. Yeah. That, okay. But only for picks. So only uh, for picks. we have okay. more, but with to all of all the other products. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Uh, Dan. Hey, um, you mentioned your monitoring strategy that you use the kind of the built-in features that came out of the box at OpenShift. In terms of external monitoring or a probe or let's say a black box, do you guys use anything uh, external to the cluster itself to monitor your applications? We use, we have uh, some metrics uh, collective systems that run uh, within like sidecars and in applications as, as libraries too that collect metrics and send to an external metric uh, collector that we have and we can produce a lot of new monitoring on that. So not, not only inside OpenShift but we collect the metrics of the applications and send it externally so we can build a lot of, a lot of new dashboards and monitoring. Kind of a mix between uh, Dynatrace, Prometheus, Grafana, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so Dynatrace is the external SaaS tool that collects the, the metrics, let's say. So if the cluster was to fall down, that was your... Not about the cluster itself, I would say, but about, uh, specific about the cluster would be Prometheus, and the specific about PIX applications would be Dynatrace and Prometheus together, right? Yeah, Dynatrace and those systems and libraries we, we built to collect all those metrics. And because develop, we built those, those libraries because to help developers collect the metrics they think they need it to. They can create metrics like product metrics or uh, system metrics to collect that and everything is, is managed externally. A lot of questions. Uh, can I go after, yeah. Hi, uh, I have a question about um, backups. Uh, and when you are using Advanced Cluster Manager, how do you manage backups for containers uh, on, on the different uh, clusters? Uh, do you have any solution or it's not necessary in your case? 
you do you mean on backups of our like the, the version of the microservice that's, that's deployed? Yes. So uh, we use that based on on image on our image registry. Uh, I think today we are using uh, ECR, AWS ECR. So every deploy that generates that image is gen generates a new version at ECR. So if we lose anything on the cluster side, we can recover just by deploying the image again. Just one. Are you talking about like data or the container itself? Both. Both? Okay, because for data, I would say there are another platforms, right, in the, with data storage and, and everything. But about containers, they do have like Quay and also ECR that have the images as well. Yes. Does that make sense? And uh, you? Yes. And I go back to you. Uh, I would like to know, like, uh, how is the performance, you know, when you're running on the bare metal now, we are, like, you know, uh, we we have an SLO of of max 500 milliseconds for all applications, and for Pix applications we have a lot that on 200 milliseconds, so that that's valid of on the on premises and on the cloud side. So on on our pipeline we have a performance synthesis step that tests all of that and and validates all all our SLOs. So if uh, a microservice doesn't achieve the SLO, it isn't deployed. So it, I can, to answer your question, I can say uh, we, uh, and we started using performance testing only with OpenShift, so I don't have the data before that because it wasn't a thing that we worry about because we had uh, fewer products and fewer users, but with PICs our, our we have a lot of users and a lot of products that we're starting worrying about. So today is for pigs 200 milliseconds, and I don't have the, the previous data for you. Thank you. So, yeah, regardless of the, the environment where the application is running, it needs to respond with the same time. Because uh, if an operation passes 10 seconds, the Central Bank of Brazil is going to cancel the operation. So yeah, you have to do it again. Question? No? More questions? I actually have two questions now, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the first one is, do you use any log ag aggregation software like Elasticsearch or Loki? Yeah, we we started using the ELK stack. Okay. But then, That's what we use on, in our environment as well. Yeah, but, but then we migrated to Splunk, using Splunk. But we have uh, a log library that we developed ourselves to generate logs in using a pattern, so it, everything will be easier with Splunk or any other tool. So uh, everything's about our logging library, regardless of the logging tool we use or the environment. So we migrated from ELK to Splunk with no with painless and no uh, other issue at all. So yeah. our logging, logging library is the main thing. Okay, cool. And then the second question is, I'm assuming your application is near persistent storage. What a kind of provider to use to provide those volumes to OpenShift? Do you use like Ceph or Portworks or something like that? Uh, for uh, on the on-premises environment, we use Oracle, so Oracle database. Okay. Uh, and it doesn't need any like file system, file system persistence in the pods themselves, just what's in the database? You guys, yeah, you actually have like uh, non-stakeless applications. Yes, they do. Uh, they do use Ceph. Okay. Uh, and uh, on the on-premise side. Is that using ODF? ODF, exactly, okay. yeah. Dollar, so. the data Foundation, exactly, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, no problem. Uh, more questions? Uh, yes, uh, Glenn. Yeah, hi. Um, I was uh, thinking uh, you're using uh, advanced cluster management. Could you maybe elaborate a bit on what you are using it for, if, like policy management, GitOps, uh, full setup of clusters? We. We are at the beginning of it. We are doing a lot of proof of concepts and tests today, uh, but mainly to we are like testing how we could have all our clusters managed the same the same way that our on-premises cluster are configured and managed. So we are getting a lot of Red Hat help for that. So we are on early stages of that. So we have we will have that soon soon enough. Yeah, I would say like uh, so we are going to the cloud right now and uh, 
trying to keep everything balanced and uh, also better uh, standardized. So ACM, we are we are on early stages of like trying to, to establish like the same configurations for the clusters, and eventually yes, we are going to come to, like, to GitOps and uh, also using different policies and other stuff. Uh, maybe a second question then, because you're a bank, do you have some other way right now that you're applying uh, policies or, or that you're checking something, or is that something that you don't account for? Other what, sorry? Or policies, but you, general. Uh, for the Central Bank, Central Bank of Brazil, you say, or like techno technologically speaking, right? No, you're talking about like regulations. Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. So, so uh, I'll answer with an example. So. As I said, PIX has to be secure. Uh, new policies and regulations uh, are created constantly because we have a lot of frauds. Uh, for example, uh, when we started, it's 24 seven, but w you could transfer any amount of money after 8 p.m. Today, you, you have a limit. So uh, like the, there's a new regulations that you have to have a limit of I think it's 5,000 reais max. You can change that with your bank, but you have a limit after 8 p.m. until 5 a.m. to to because of frauds or anything. And the the Basin security, the central bank security team keeps uh, investigating and and releasing new regulations and policies for that. Henrique, can you go back to that slide of the SPI? So sure. uh, we have two types of participants in the system. Uh, one is called uh, indirect participant and the other one is called direct participant. So the direct participants, they need to have kind of like a long-term relationship. They, they had to uh, like be at the Central Bank of Brazil, uh, had a relationship with the Central Bank of Brazil for a long, 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 long time. Uh, but to make it uh, the real-time payment systems broad, they created this category of the indirect participant. So there are some institutions that they don't have to follow the same rules as Bank Original, but they are still able to use it, the real-time payment systems through the APIs. So they need to follow like the strict rules and regulations, but those ones, they are still included, but they use it through uh, other participants. Uh, basically, the, the policies and the, the rules are restricted to the regulated banks. That, that's why indirect participants cannot uh, interact directly with the, the addressing database, only through direct participants. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Another question? You got a question? No. Here. <laughs> Here? Yes. Man, in the slide, you showed 113 TPS. Yeah, I think it's the end. I, that's too much. How do you handle that traffic? What is your OP management strategy? So this was with peaks. It was a peak. So uh, what helped us handle that was HPA with our cluster and the performance SLOs uh, the, and the performance testing I mentioned we had on our, on our pipeline. So uh, we can, if, we can evict performance issues on the QA environment. So because, uh, before going to production or staging environment, because if a system doesn't meet all the requirements, performance token, uh, it won't go to production. So HPA and uh, uh, the probes and the performance testing we have on our, on our pipeline helped us a lot to achieve that. It was a peak, so we can achieve a lot more. Our environment w was healthy, but if we continue that for like a day or two, maybe something will, some problem will pop up, pop out, and we will had to solve that. That's okay. uh, yeah, and uh, you asked specifically about API management, like a tool or release structure. Okay, uh, yeah, but you. that so both unique right so especially in an open shift no, especially in an open shift environment right um, performance tuning we all understand regular of our tuning strategies and all of that right can you can you give us you know the one big thing 
that was in the way and you guys had to solve for OpenShift for perf tuning, right? Any, any one big dog that you had to, you know, sort of solve for. That'll be helpful. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> sorry. Thank you. Uh, the most difficult, as we said, was the co culture of all our teams. So our infrastructure team manage a bunch of VMs and bare metal and all of that. So we didn't have knowledge and a culture of a distributed architecture talking about, uh, I think few people knew about what a pod what, what a pod was. So the learning curve, I think, and the culture, the, the spread of the culture were the, the most difficult challenges we faced. Uh, that's why uh, when we met, we met, uh, I, I talked to him about all these opportunities and needs we had to spread that culture and that knowledge throughout the company. We actually met in an Ansible event, right? Yeah. It wasn't even OpenShift. Yeah, it was an Ansible yeah. event. And uh, because uh, technologically talking, it's, we had all Red Hat support, but because it's configuration, installation, and uh, read the doc stuff. But uh, when we talk about culture and a learning curve of different, a different set of teams, that's when the, the challenge came for us. Yeah, if, if I can dig just a little deeper, like in, this is a typical digital transformation scenario, uh, not only for the market, but for the companies itself, because uh, you need to have like, the way that you work like uh, prior to, to, those, to that revolution, it's not going to work if you want to solve the problems that way. If you don't implement like SLOs, SLIs, SLAs, site reliability engineering, platform engineering, and other kinds of technologies that can help you, you're either going to take that long to, to solve all the challenges or not going to be able to do it. So when we, when we started, like the way it was like, okay, so we have the tool and we know how to use it, uh, so how to tune it as well. Uh, how we can spread out this message across the bank because I cannot have like the architecture team being called like every day when you have a problem at 4 a.m. if they don't manage, if they didn't have like, if they, they weren't the ones that made the changes like to the code. Just because they know OpenShift, that's not, that's not the right answer, right? So the first, the first uh, thing that we did was like, okay, you guys have like webinars, right? So a lot of time. Yeah, we, uh, we are done, right? There are more questions. They need to just stay here. <laughs> but yeah, it's not, it's not all about technology, it's about partnership and also culture. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, guys.